Well, got your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians 1. We'll begin our, uh, just, this is just a, an introduction to the book of First Thessalonians, and so we'll do just a, a quick walk through it. Let me tell you a little bit about this city where this church that Paul is writing was located. Oh, by the way. First Thessalonians is probably the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to any church that we have here recorded in our Bibles. It was a young church. It was only a few months old when he wrote this letter to them. You can see how the church actually came into existence on Paul's uh, second missionary journey. It's found in the book of Acts in chapter 17, I'm not going to turn there, but do you remember in Acts 16, uh, Paul was planning to go to, um, to Asia, what today would be uh, uh, modern Turkey, and God gave him a vision. And in that night vision, he had a vision of a man from Europe a man from what today is modern Greece. It's called Macedonia. This man from Macedonia appeared in this night vision to Paul and asked, uh, asked him to come over to Macedonia and help them. And so Paul agreed that was God's will. He immediately made plans. Instead of going east, to go west, young man, go west. And west he went. And uh, the first place he went was Philippi. That's the first church that was planted when he went west to Europe. You remember what happened in, in uh, that city of Philippi or Philippi, actually? He got, he got uh, arrested. He got beaten. He got thrown into a dungeon and a prison. Uh, there was an earthquake. As a result, the warden and uh, his family, his whole household got saved. A church was established there in that city. <clears throat> then he left there, and uh, this is the next city that he plants a church in, in what would be called uh, Thessalonia. Uh, and uh, today, the city still exists, by the way. It's called uh, uh, Salonika today. But uh, it was a city that was an ancient city. It was a thriving seaport city. And uh, it was also on a very important trade route in that day. It was a city that was originally called Thur uh, Therma because it was famous for hot springs. However... It got renamed Thessalonica by one of the generals of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's general, Cassander, he married the daughter of Alexander's uh, father, Philip of Macedon. He, he married this, this girl. She was the half-sister of Alexander, and he named uh, Therma after his wife when he conquered it and called it Thessaloniki. As a result, this city flourished. It was a thriving city then, and under uh, that uh, development, it became the capital of that whole area called Macedonia. Back in the day when Paul started the church there, it was about 200,000 people, population-wise. Today, the city is about 300,000. When you read Acts 17 and the starting of this church, it says that Paul spent three Sabbaths preaching in the synagogue there. And uh, so about three weeks, about a month preaching in the synagogue. And then you remember uh, sometime after that, he was staying in the house of a, of a man named Justice and uh, or, or Jason rather, and Jason was arrested and uh, was brought before the magistrates, the city magistrates, and uh, 
And I think the reason being is because he was housing Paul and his mission team. And when they were no longer in the synagogue, they were conducting uh, meetings out of Jason's house. I don't think Paul spent very long here. If he was only about three weeks preaching the gospel in the synagogue, then outside of the synagogue in Jason's house, uh, maybe he spent another three or four months. We're thinking probably no longer than, than five or six months in the city of Thessaloniki. And that's this is what happened. It was a vigorous church. You, we read that first chapter. It, it was a vigorous church. It, it was a church that was struggling because it immediately began to suffer persecution uh, for becoming believers in Jesus of Nazareth. It was a church that immediately suffered persecution from the Jewish population there, and there were many Jewish people there because of the uh, the uh, the commerce that flourished there. But also, it suffered persecution from the pagans because they no longer fit in with the pagan lifestyle uh, overall in that city, which is made up mostly of uh, pagan Greeks, uh, Gentiles. There's a strong um, influence of immorality. You can imagine, not only is it a seaport city, but it's a pagan city. They worshiped uh, uh, pagan systems of worship that involved approved sexual immorality. And so he deals with that later on in the fourth chapter of this book of First Thessalonians. But the major issue that you'll find in the book of First Thessalonians is that these people had a misunderstanding of the second coming. And they had a misunderstanding of the kingdom. And they did not understand that uh, prior to the establishment of the kingdom, Jesus was going to come and there was nothing that needed to be accomplished before he appeared. His coming was going to be imminent. And you know what's really striking about this book, and of course all of Paul's writings, is Paul is not expecting anything to happen or having to happen before Jesus returns for believers, for his church. It is what is called the doctrine or the teaching of imminency. That is, that Jesus can return at any moment. No prophecy has to be fulfilled for Jesus to return to gather together his people, the church. And that's what he straightens out here, uh, mainly in this book of 1 Thessalonians. Because these people were so confused they thought, okay, if Jesus is coming at any moment, then, you know, let's quit our jobs and let's just wait for him. And some of them did that. They, they didn't under, that's not just them. This has happened throughout church history where there have been cults or people that have misunderstood prophecy and they've done crazy off the wall kind of stuff, we would say, like this. Uh, there, there was a group that uh, they quit their jobs. This was back in the 1800s, and they went up on a mountain waiting for Jesus to return. Of course, he never showed up, and uh, so their lives really got messed up in their families' lives. There was tensions in this church. Um, there was, I think, an indifference because of really not understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. The letter of First Thessalonians, you can divide it easily into two parts. The first three chapters is very personal. In the first three chapters, Paul talks about his personal attitude and, uh, and feelings for the church. In the second chapter, he talks about his personal ministry among the people there in uh, Thessalonica. And uh, in the third chapter, he just shares how um, he can't wait to, uh, to hear from Timothy how they're doing, and when he hears how much joy that brings to his heart. The second part isn't personal, it's practical, and that's chapters four and five. 
It's a very practical part. And he addresses mainly four ways that Christians are to live their lives in chapters four and five. So that's just a little bit of a break up, a breakdown and, and rather uh, a, a sketch of what this book is about, First Thessalonians. So I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll read it. I hope you'll work on the memory verses uh, that we've assigned with this uh, study because it'll be rich if you'll really get into it like that. Before we start, let's pause a moment, have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin looking at the personal part of this letter. Heavenly Father, thank you today for bringing us together. Thank you for the, the shelter that we have from the, the frigid weather. Thank you for just giving us a, a fellowship together with one another. But mainly, Lord, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for reaching reaching down to us. Thank you for the, the relationship that you've established with, with many of us. And Lord, if there's any that don't know you, may this be the day in which they'd come to know you aright and become the recipients of life eternal. Lord, uh, would you open our hearts and uh, open our spiritual eyes as well that we might uh, receive what it is that you have to say to us and that it might uh, just accomplish your purpose in us. We want to be more like you as your people. And so we ask that that would be the result. It, it wouldn't just be head knowledge that we would gain, but you'd warm our hearts as well and, and have our, our love and, and our devotion and uh, our obedience in Jesus' name. So the first part, the personal part of this book, first three chapters, in chapter one, there are three things that he says about the church there in uh, Thessaloniki. Look at what he says here, uh, beginning in verse three. He says, I'm remembering without ceasing, I'm always mindful of three things, your work of faith, your labor of love, and the patience of hope that you have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Three things. Now, I want you to match those three things with what he says in verses 9 and 10, because I think there's a connection here. He says, you know what? Everyone, not only in that province of Macedonia and Achaia, have heard of your good testimony, what God's done among you, <laughs> but it's even gone, rung out further than that. And he says, um, so that we don't even have to talk about it. They tell us what they've heard about you. Verse nine, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how fruitful our ministry was among you. How that ye, see this, turned to God from idols to serve, uh, to turn to God from idols. I match that with verse three, the work of faith. And then he says to serve the living and true God. I connect that with the labor of love in verse three. And then in verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven. I connect that with the patience of hope in verse 3. So there's a connection between those three things. And actually, those three things in verse 3, um, the work of faith, which is the turning, and the, the labor of love, the serving, and the patience of hope, the waiting, that really is an outline for the three chapters of, uh, of personal that Paul gives. First of all, in chapter one, it's all about the fact that these people turned. They turned. Notice how they turned. It says in that ninth verse, how you turned to God from idols. Now that's the right order. That is really the order in which a person is saved. You turned to God. And when you turn to God, it's like you do a 180. When you turn to God, if I if I turn to this group over here, 
And then I turn to this, these men over here. I turn my back to them. They turned to God from idols. I remember when I was in uh, the Soviet Union, I actually was in uh, the far east of Russia. Back in the days, just after the Berlin Wall fell, and uh, we were on the border of China. And I was there on an evangelistic trip with some other men. We were there for three weeks, and we were giving out tracts right and left. And the, it's like the people couldn't take them quick enough. Uh, they were so open and so hungry because uh, the, the door had just been opened for this kind of work. And uh, there were Chinese businessmen that were coming over uh, the Amur River from China into this uh, area of the far east of Russia and uh, having business associations. And so we had both Russian language literature and, uh, and Chinese literature. And I remember there was a couple of Chinese business. Somehow my partner and I, we connected with them. We couldn't speak their language, but one of the men was able to speak Russian because they were there to do business in Russia. And so they were interested in the literature we gave them in their language. And so we set up an, an appointment to meet with them in the apartment where they were staying. And uh, I'll never forget the, the joy of having one of those two men trust Christ as his savior before we were, we were out of there. But I remember specifically saying to him, now you understand that if you trust Christ as Savior, then you're turning your back on all the gods, all the other gods that uh, perhaps you worship or have worshipped in your past. Uh, you're turning your back on all other gods, and you are turning to the true and living God. And uh, he understood that and wanted Christ to be his one and only uh, true and living God and Savior. And so chapter one is about just that, how these people in that pagan city of Thessalonica, they turn from the world, they turn from religion, pagan religion, idolatry, and uh, they turn to God. They turn from the attitudes of the world and religion. They turn from the power structure that was uh, associated with that. They turned from the values of the world and this religion, this paganism, and they turned to God and God saved them and God transformed them by his grace in Christ and uh, saved them in the midst of, the e of an evil world in an evil environment like that. God's still doing that. The wonderful thing is nothing's changed. The world is just as evil as ever, and it's getting worse all the time. And yet God is still in the business of saving people by his grace, transforming them from former pagans to serve the true and living God. This work of faith that he talks about in that third verse. And he says, as a result of your turning to God, you become an example to everyone. Look at what he says in verse 7. So that you were examples to all that believe in the two provinces there, what is today Greece, Macedonia, and Achaia. And he says, for from you sounded out. That's, that's interesting. Echoed or reverberated uh, the word of the Lord. <laughs> not only in those two provinces of Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad. It, it reverberates. It's like a ripple effect that has gone out over that whole area so that we need not to speak anything. People understand because they see and they've, they see and have heard your testimony, how you turned to God from idols. And that's what it's about. You turn to God, and when you do that, you turn your back on idolatry. You turn your back on paganism. You turn your back on this world. You turn your back to everything that is against God when you turn to God. It just is 
the natural outcome. By the way, this map that has been up here is actually a map of Paul's second missionary journey. You can see it uh, on the, uh, the screen nearest you. But uh, he starts on his second missionary journey right here uh, from this city of Antioch. That's where uh, he and uh, Barnabas, they had come back from the first missionary journey back to their home church that sent them out in Antioch. And uh, remember, during their first missionary trip, John Mark, who wrote our Gospel of Mark, he was a young guy. He got homesick or something, and he left. He was part of their mission team, but he, he went home. And uh, when they were ready to launch their second uh, trip, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them on the second trip, even though he bailed out on the first. Well, Mark, John Mark was Barnabas' uh, nephew, and he wanted to develop him, take him under his wing. And Paul said, nothing doing. I'm not going to have him on this trip with us. He pulled that last time. He's not coming this time. And it says, the Bible says that the disagreement between them was, was really sharp. It was really tough. And so what happened was Barnabas and John, they w went out on their own. And Paul took another partner. Instead of Barnabas, he took uh, Silvanus, as we read in, in that first verse, or Silas and others. There's another guy that they, they pick up in uh, Thessalonica, or Thessalonica. His name is Aristarchus. Uh, we saw him in the last chapter of the book of Colossus. He was uh, a, a co-prisoner with Paul. Maybe he became a prisoner just to minister to Paul. I don't know. But Luke also joins them. So they leave Antioch and they go through uh, this region and then they end up, remember, at Troas, that's where they get the Macedonian vision. And then they cross to Neapolis and Philippi and then down here to Thessalonica. You can see it right at the, the top uh, corner there. This is where we're at. This is where they started. And that's where True. Thessalonica is, all right? So you can take the map down. I just wanted you to see that. Uh, get a picture of where uh, we're talking about in the world. That's Europe. That's Greece today, as I said. <clears throat> so here they are. Chapter 2, I think, really is the word not turned, but served. It says, we, we know how you turned from God, uh, turned to God, rather, from idols to serve the living and true God. And so chapter two, chapter one was they turned. Chapter two is they served. But it's not the service of the church. It's not the service of the Thessalonians that is being highlighted in chapter two. Actually, it's Paul and how he served the church. That's what chapter two is all about. It, how he served them without any pretense. How he served them and yet, at the same time, he worked. He, he, he was bivocational. He worked to support himself. He didn't, uh, he didn't expect them to support him, even though he could have. How blameless his behavior was among them. And then uh, he expresses in verse 13 to the end of the chapter his personal concern for the suffering of these young believers. You know, it's one thing. If you've been saved for years and years, and then all of a sudden persecution breaks out and you have to deal with it, you have to face persecution for being a believer in Jesus. These people had only been saved for months, uh, if that, and then they faced persecution, but they still remained faithful. And so we have a tremendous description of Paul's pastoral ministry among these people in just the short months he was there with them in the second chapter of First Thessalonians. And then the third chapter, I think, again, keys in with that third verse and that uh, tenth verse, where it talks about their patience of hope and how they waited. And so the third chapter is really, that's the key, how they waited. And, in, and the waiting that is being referred to is to wait for his son from heaven. 
they waited, Paul waited, and he was waiting for a report. Verse uh, chapter three tells us Timothy was sent to Thessalonica to bring a report back to Paul because Paul was really concerned about uh, what was going on there. He says in chapter three, if you look at it, verse one, when we could no longer hold out, we could no longer forbear, we thought it we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. I, I stayed in Athens, but I sent Timothy, our brother, and the minister of God, a fellow laborer in the gospel. I sent him to you to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith. Verse three, that no man should be moved by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And so when, when we heard about your suffering, I wanted to send Timothy so that he could encourage you and further establish you and also bring a report back to us. When Timothy came back with the report, it just thrilled Paul's heart. Look at this, verse 6. When Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, your charity, your good remembrance of us always, desiring to see us, we were comforted, verse 7. We were comforted over you. We were encouraged that in all your affliction and distress by your faith, you still stand fast in the Lord despite all that you've, you've suffered. And we, uh, what thanks can we render to God again for you? And we joy, verse 9, for your sakes before God, night and day praying for you. So Timothy was sent. The report uh, comes back. These people are steadfast in the face of persecution. Why are they? Because I think, as uh, chapter 1 tells us, they had a patience of hope. Or as uh, it says in verse 10, they were waiting for his son from heaven. They had hope in their persecution. Underlying hope and that underlying hope was what we would call the blessed hope. It was the blessed hope of the any moment appearing of Jesus. That they were they were living and staying true to the Lord because they believed that the Lord could come at any moment and he would want and they would want him to find them faithful and they would also be rescued when he did come. And so they were waiting, and they were waiting patiently because they had hope. Because their, their minds were set on the Lord, his appearing. Remember in Colossians 3, set your affections on things above. Uh, think on things above. Don't be focused on things of this earth. He says, um, Seek those things where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And that's what these people were doing. And they're just new at it. But they're, they're focused on Jesus. They're focused on the any moment appearing. You know, there is a special reward that is, uh, that is offered and that will be received by believers who are said to love the appearing of Jesus. That's what Paul says. There's a crown of righteousness that uh, the Lord has reserved for any believer in any time during the church age that loves the appearing of Jesus. So check yourself this morning. Can you honestly claim to love his appearing? If you believe in the imminency of him, of his appearing at any time, any moment, nothing hindering him from coming back, then you must develop a love for his appearing. These people turned, chapter 1. They served, Paul and him, them. And they waited, Paul and these people. They were waiting. And the overarching theme of the book of 1 Thessalonians is the greatest presentation of what I would call rapture truth anywhere in the Bible. You know, there's not a whole lot about the rapture in the Bible. Jesus is the first one to bring it to our attention. Did you know that? And this is in the Old Testament dispensation. Remember, even though it's in our New Testament book uh, of John, 
Jesus is the first one that speaks of the rapture. He doesn't call it that, but he, he's talking about it in John 14 when he said, I'm going to go away, but don't fear. Don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am there, there you may be also. He's not, he's not speaking about the second coming. He's speaking about the rapture of his people, us, the church. And then it's mentioned uh, in, in passing by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Will not all sleep? Will not all die? But uh, we'll all be changed. We'll all be metamorphosized. We'll all be transformed. And he's talking about a physical transformation in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He's referring to the rapture. And then chapter 4 which we're turning to at this point, has the most information about the rapture of the church, the imminent return of Jesus for his people, the church, anywhere else in the Bible. We'll get to that eventually when we get to chapter 4. But in the second part of the division that we've given to the book of 1 Thessalonians, from the personal, now we turn to the practical, and in chapters 4 and 5, as I said in the introduction, there are four ways that he addresses that believers are to live the Christian life. Now, if you've been drifting uh, and not following me so far, please fine-tune it, if you will. You don't have to do that anymore. Remember when you had to fine-tune the TV, you get lines or something, you have to go over there and mess with the antennas or the, or the, the fine-tuning. The fine tune, if you know what that means. And uh, this is where I want us to really, uh, again, spend the, the bulk of our time. Remember, remember that this city was a, it was a, a sailor's town. It was a place where there's a, a huge, massive commercial seaport. And ships were pulling in and out of there all the time. And with that, there were sailors that had been at sea for weeks and months, and they were looking for some fun. You follow me? And as I said, pagan idolatry in that city, it was part of their religious practice to incorporate sexual immorality. So it's no wonder that when he begins chapter 4, here's what he says. We beseech you, we beg you, brethren, and we exhort you by the Lord Jesus, as ye have received of us, how you ought to walk, that is, conduct your lives, and to please God, that you would abound more and more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your holiness. That's what the word sanctification means. And to be holy or to be sanctified means that you separate yourselves from evil. Not in the lust of concupiscence, that's evil desire. Even as the Gentiles, the pagan nations do, which don't know God. He says, no man go beyond and defraud his brother in Christ in any matter because the Lord's the avenger of all such. He's not called us unto uncleanness, but holiness. And what he says in that third verse, this is the will of God, your holiness, notice this, that you abstain from, that means stay away from, fornication. And fornication in the Bible is a big umbrella word for all sexual immorality whether it's in your head or whether you actually carry it out. All sexual immorality, it comes under that heading of fornication. And so in this practical section of the book of 1 Thessalonians, he speaks to a sexual saturated city. And he's telling them in these first uh, few verses how to live pure and how to please God. And the way that you do it is the way that you live, period, by faith. The way that you live in purity 
is not by struggling to live up to some standard that is imposed upon you, but you learn to depend upon the fact that we saw in Colossians. You learn to depend upon Christ who lives in you to live his life through you. And when you do that, guess what? You abstain from fornication. You avoid sexual immorality. And you live in purity. So the first part of this practical appeal or exhortation in 1 Thessalonians, beginning in the fourth chapter, is an appeal to purity. And the second one, in verses 9 to 12, is an appeal to honesty, to live honestly. Here's what he says, as touching brotherly love, I don't need to write to you. You know how God taught you to love one another, and uh, that love ought to increase more and more. And verse 11, and study to be quiet and do your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you walk honestly toward them that are without and that you might have lack of nothing. What's going on here? Remember, I mentioned that as a result of them believing that Jesus could come back at any moment, some of them had become idle. They had quit their jobs. And as a result, uh, that's not good. <laughs> idle hands are the devil's workshop, right? And so as a result, he they, they create uh, problems. And so he tells them, look, I know that you're confused about the coming of Christ because you've quit working. You need, to, you need to be responsible for yourselves. Get busy and uh, don't expect other people in the church to support you financially. And if there's a genuine need, that's one thing. But if you, are, if you have uh, the ability to work and support yourselves, then you need to do that. This is what he means when he says that you would uh, you'd, uh, be quiet and that you would walk honestly. You conduct your lives in an honest manner. The third area in this practical appeal is in the area of what we've already called imminency, and that's in verses 13 to 18. These are memory verses for us. Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, meaning believers that have uh, physically died, because I don't want you to sorrow as the pagans sorrow when they have a loved one die. They don't have any hope, but you do. Verse 14, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, your family members or your brothers and sisters in Christ that have died physically, guess what? He's going to bring, Jesus is going to bring them back with him. For we say this by the word of the Lord. I've been given direct revelation from the Lord about this, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will not prevent or precede them which are asleep, those that have uh, died in Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Imminency is the practical area. Of these, these people misunderstood Jesus is coming. And the major problem that, uh, uh, this is the major problem that this whole book addresses. But the thing that they're confused on is they have a they they think that those that will be alive will when Jesus returns will enter the kingdom but the ones that are dead will miss the kingdom. Now they have a misunderstanding of the resurrection as well as his coming because the resurrection according to the new testament is not a single event but groups of believers uh, are resurrected at different times. And uh, when you understand that, when you put all that together, and we'll cover that in detail when we get to this passage in our study, all of the stuff just, it, it makes sense. It disappears. And so 
He's telling them that the dead will be raised at the coming uh, when when Jesus co- when they uh, they come back with Jesus. He'll raise their bodies, and uh, they'll be they'll be regathered, and uh, with the church that is alive. It's it's called uh, his coming is called the Parousia, Parousia, and it's before his second coming. And uh, it's before his establishing the kingdom that he's promised to Israel. And there's approximately, not exactly, but approximately seven years between the rapture and the second coming. And that period of time is called the 70th week of Daniel, if you remember when we went through that book. So, and then the last area of practicality that he covers is the whole chapter five. And really, it's how to live confidently, how to live confidently. He begins by saying in the first verse, but of the times, chapter 5, verse 1, of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly, notice this phrase, the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they'll not escape. But ye, brethren, see the contrast between them and us, between the lost and the saved, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Now, there are two days in Scripture that you really need to understand and distinguish. Here, there is reference to what is called the day of the Lord. In verse 2, it becomes very clear that the day of the Lord does not refer to believers, but to unbelievers. The day of the Lord refers to lost people. And uh, it's going to come upon them, the lost world, as a thief in the night. You know, years ago when I was a teenager, there was a... There was a movie that came out called A Thief in the Night and was about the rapture. Jesus does not come for his church as a thief in the night. That's not referring to believers. That's referring to unbelievers. Unbelievers are going to be caught totally off guard. He's going, the day of the Lord is the day of judgment for this earth. The day of the Lord is that 70th week of Daniel. The day of the Lord is God's judgment being poured out on this earth. And it uh, and it clearly is for the lost. There's a second word in the Bible that I want you to distinguish from the day of the Lord. It's called the day of Christ. And the day of Christ involves his working with believers. For example... If you were with us when we studied Philippians, in that sixth verse of the first chapter, Paul says something like this, that we're confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Christ. So the day of Christ doesn't refer to believers, or unbelievers, it refers to believers. And the day of the Lord refers to the lost who will be surprised because it'll come upon them that day of the Lord like the like a thief in the night, but it, it won't be a surprise for believers because they won't even be here. They'll already be gone. They'll all be raptured. That's what the chapter four uh, was all about. That's why this follows chapter four. So question, all right. If all of this is so, then... What should we be practicing as believers? In the meantime, before Jesus comes for us, what should we be doing? Obviously, we should be working, right? We should be busy. We should be living confidently. And he gives us some areas in which we live confidently. Look at verses 6 to 11, for example. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us be watch and be sober. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that get drunk, they get drunk in the night. But we're not of the night. We're of the day. 
Be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith, love, and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to tell you now, that's not talking about salvation from hell. That's talking about deliverance from the 70th week of Daniel in the context here. Okay? So what's he saying? He's saying you live confidently because you can be hopeful that even though we are in the last days and the last days will wax worse and worse, you have hope because you're going to be raptured out of here before, shall I say it this way, all hell breaks loose on this earth. You talk, people talk about it being hell on earth. They haven't seen anything yet. Jesus said there is coming in that 70th week of Daniel such a hell on earth, if I can use that terminology, that there has never been a day like that, and there never will be a day that will match it. But we're hopeful because we won't be here for that because it's not meant for us. We're meant to be delivered from it. So we're hopeful. How do we live confidently? We live hopeful. We also live peaceful. Look at verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I think that's me. I think they're talking about, I think he's talking about me in this church and others that are in spiritual leadership. This is how you're to view us. Okay. It doesn't mean that that uh, we who are in spiritual leadership, look down on you, not at all. We're on the same level, as. Uh, but you're to value those that are over you in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So how do you live confidently in these last days? You're hopeful, you're peaceful. You appreciate one another, you help one another, you forgive one another. You forbear one another. You live peacefully. And then what else? Well, you live confidently because you're joyful. I want you to note verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Paul said it differently in Philippians 4.4. 4. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So how do you rejoice evermore? You rejoice because you joy in the Lord. You joy in him. Remember, you're focused on things above. You're focused on him and the things that pertain to him. That's how you joy in the Lord. But also, you're dependent upon the Spirit of God who produces this fruit of joyfulness in you. And so you take joy. You claim it as a provision that God gives if you want it. So you can live confidently and uh, always, always joyful. doesn't mean that everything that happens is a good thing, but it means that you can have joy in the worst circumstances because you have hope. You know it's all going to work out in the end. You know God's using this. And then you're to live confidently by being prayerful. Look at verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Don't ever stop praying. You know, I was just reading this morning I, I, in, in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 11. What's he stressing in that uh, the first half of that chapter? Don't give up praying. Pray persistently. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Be persistent in prayer. When you don't feel like praying, that's the time you need to pray more than ever. Continue in prayer. Stay in that closet, so to speak, with the Lord. Because prayer is much more than, than asking and receiving. It's that. Prayer is a divine fellowship. It's a connection with God that you can't live without. That's why he says, pray evermore or pray without ceasing. And then in verse 18, you're to, you can live confidently not only because you're joyful and hopeful and peaceful but and prayerful, but you're grateful. He says, in everything give thanks. 
This is God's will for you. I mean, you get hit and you give thanks to God. Well, you do if you trust him. You do if you believe him. You do if if you're dependent upon him. You, you can give thanks when this building is flooded because Hurricane Sandy hit it. I remember coming in here and looking at the total devastation that morning. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know what he said? In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so I did. By faith. Didn't look like I was like I should be thankful. But I knew God was going to do something through this. And he did. And grateful for all. In everything, give thanks. That's God's will for you. You want to live in the will of God? Start right there. Start giving thanks for everything. People are so concerned at times about finding, especially young people, oh, I want to know what God's will is for my life. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're concerned about that. Start right here. Start giving thanks for everything that God allows into your sphere. Be thankful in everything. How do you live confidently? Well, you're faithful too. Look at uh, verse 19 to 22. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil, be faithful in the way you live and serving the Lord, be faithful. And then I ended the last two verses, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. How do you live confidently? By being fruitful. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is that he produces the fruit of the Spirit in and through your life. That's what it's about. First Thessalonians was written to a new group of believers who are suffering persecution for their faith in Christ. And Paul was in the next uh, town from Thessalonica, he went down to uh, Corinth. And so he wrote both letters to the Thessalonians from the city of Corinth. And when Timothy returned, as we saw in chapter 3, with that encouraging report, it was a picture of, uh, of a church full of really healthy spiritual hearts. And of course, Paul had a healthy spiritual heart. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on heart health in our culture, right? And uh, that's a good thing. Well, what about the church's spiritual heart? What about your spiritual heart health? How's that today? First Thessalonians is really a picture of healthy hearts. There's not perfection here, but there is an overall spiritual heart health among both the preacher and the people, the great source of encouragement, I think, for suffering believers is First Thessalonians because it's all about the blessed hope that we have in our Lord. Do we have any bowlers here? Anyone bowl or used to bowl or, yeah, whatever? Yeah. I'm not uh, much of a bowler, but I like to do it once in a while. Up in Maine, where my son uh, pastors, they have what they call uh, 10 pin, 10 pin candle. Yeah. And the, and the, the bowling pins are, are really small and straight almost, not big and fat. And the balls are like, they can fit in your hand, in, in the palm of your hand. Candle like pen bowling. Pin. Yeah. Anyway. You know, bowling, it involves throwing a ball at a selected mark on the floor near the end of the lane. See those little arrows nearest to you at the top of the lane like that? If you aim at that mark close uh, to you in line with the pins, you'll always score. You may not always get a strike, but you'll always score. 
And I think that kind of illustrates what Paul's doing here as part of a wise approach to life. When, as Paul wrote to these Thessalonians about the return of Christ, he reminded them of their ultimate goal. That's knocking the pins down, you might say. That their salvation, that the goal of their salvation was that they were going to be be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus. But he was teaching them to focus their, their, their spiritual eyes on the near actions that were in line with that goal. He urged them to comfort one another. I didn't read this, but in chapter five, comfort one another, um, support the weak, uh, warn people that are wayward, pray without ceasing, and rejoice always, etc. And then he added that we have to do that by the power of Christ who is working in us. And that's what, the, what verse 24 says. Faithful is he who calleth you, who also will do it. He's going to accomplish it as you depend upon him to do that. So we ought to pray, Lord, help us to see what we can do today that will keep us focused on that eternal goal that you've set for us. And that eternal goal is, again, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. It's going to be done. You depend upon him to do it.